Chapter 15 A Brief Account of Rationality According to the Muslims The topic of discussion is the enhancement of rational or intellectual talent, that is, intellection, intellect, and knowledge, all under the rubric of aql. Islam has such logic that it always seeks the assistance or help of the intellect. That is, whenever it invites people, it stimulates their minds and it does not say, if you want to have faith, you should never think. You must not have any intellection. Intellection will lead man nowhere. Faith is a level different from that of intellection and thinking. One must submit in order to uncover the truth of faith. Such words are very common, especially in Christianity. At the end of the last session, Muhandis Bazargan pointed out that the subject does not need elaboration. That is, it does not need to be explained beyond what has already been explained. But there is another subject which good to be discussed, and that is, we hear from many Muslims the exact opposite. In the Qur'an, the intellect is sanctified and highly thought of and sought after, but in the logic of Muslims, the intellect or knowledge is sometimes looked down upon. I told him that I was conscious of this point, and it was included in my previous notes, and it is worthy to point them out. Today, I want to touch a bit on this subject. It is really so. In the first degree, disparagement of the intellect and knowledge can be read about a lot in our literature, both mystical irfani, and non-mystical literature. Moreover, certain events that have to do with the question of the intellect happened in history. One was the theological event related to the Ash'arites and the Mu'tazilites. Another was the jurisprudential event related to Abu Hanifa's analogy or Qiyas and the opposition to it. The third event had to do with mysticism, Irfan, and Sufism, Tasawwuf. These were more or less main events which must be discussed. Here, we are actually dealing with three distinct schools of thought in each of which we can see a particular kind of opposition to the intellect but each of them is distinct and has its own particular form. Apart from these schools of thought, there are also sporadic statements here and there, and not as schools of thought, which became proverbial to all of us, and these things which become proverbial to people have tremendous intellectual impact in the sense that they exert strong influence in the molding of their spirit. Initially, we shall tackle these sporadic statements and then we will deal with the said three schools of thought. The disparagement of the intellect in the parables of peoples and religions. In these sporadic statements, sometimes the intellect or intelligence is condemned for being an alleged enemy of man because it deprives him of comfort, it robs him of ease. Why? It is because if a person has no intellect or intelligence, he cannot sense anything, and when he cannot sense anything, he cannot perceive sources of inconvenience, and when he cannot perceive sources of inconvenience, the pain which is caused by these sources of inconvenience cannot be sensed by him. For example, there is a following line of poetry which says, The enemy of my soul is my intellect and my intelligence. How I wish my eyes and my ears were not open. Sometimes, we ourselves also say, for instance, fortunate is so-and-so, as he cannot understand certain things, or how fortunate are you, you are so at ease that you cannot understand. I am unfortunate, as I can sense and I can understand. Farruhi Yazdi was a revolutionary leader of the last half century. He says, it saw the things that are not supposed to be seen. By God, my killer is my sharp vision. We have many similar instances. Is it basically a sound logic though, or not? If we take it seriously, it is not sound. In the words of the scholars of rhetoric, most of those who have such utterances wanted to convey the requisite of the subject 
and not the subject itself. That is, the one who uttered the following line does not really mean that he is pleased for being bereft of understanding. The enemy of my soul is my intellect and my intelligence. How I wish my eyes and my ears were not open. Instead, he wanted to say that there is pain, but when he wanted to express the existence of the causes of discomfort, he expressed it in that way. That is, this is not actually a condemnation of the intellect. It is a sort of literary expression. Similarly, Mr. Farruhi said, It saw the things that are not supposed to be seen. By God, my killer is my sharp vision. He is referring to social problems, saying, I can see social defects, deficiencies, and inadequacies. These things will be my killer, and they became his killer. In the end, he was assassinated. If you had asked Mr. Farruhi, do you prefer to be like so-and-so who does not feel any pain for being indifferent and lax? He would have said no. One can make a rational inference against the intellect in which the human intellect causes the sense of pain. Is pain good or bad? Pain is something bad. Anything which causes pain is also bad. The reason for this is also clear. The pain we talk about is bad. Pain has its own philosophy. Pain is awareness. Pain is not good in the sense that its causes should not exist. When we say that there should be no pain, it means that there should be no cause of pain. Otherwise, if it causes pain, then it is an ailment or defect. Pain is an awareness for man. The same is true for pain experienced by limbs of the body. The human body feels pain because of discomfort. Given this pain, nature informs him that there is a problem here. It is like the red light in front of the driver's seat indicating that the car has low amount of gasoline or the gasoline is about to be finished. The driver is expected to be displeased with this, but were there no red light, the engine would have exploded. Obviously, he should not say that it is something bad that the red light lit because the said light indicates that there is something wrong here. If there were no pain, Man could not sense any defect, and as a result, ailing limbs could not be treated. So pain, in itself, is not bad. What is bad is that which expresses this pain. Pain is a wake-up call for man to look for treatment. As such, the worst ailment is that which is painless in the sense that it shows no indication of its existence. Some types of cancer are a case in point. When the patient becomes aware of his illness, it is already too late. Otherwise, if the cancer had been detected in its initial stage, it could have been treated much easier. The human intellect, intelligence, or feeling is not condemned for being the source of feeling or experiencing pain, because this is the pain of awareness, and it gives awareness. It is the opposite of laxity and insensitivity. For this reason, we have an elegant point in our literature. If we take seriously the criticism on the intellect or intelligence, it is actually the opposite and it is an appreciation of pain. O oh Lord, make my breast be familiar with pain. What pain is praised in other instances? These have pointed to the fact that to have pain is to have awareness. To have pain is a wake-up call for movement, action, and looking for a solution, while to have no pain means silence, insensitivity, and laxity. Rumi has a very elegant poem in this regard. He says, As there is begrudging and lamentation in a sick person, the entire period of sickness is wakefulness. The inconvenience and feelings of sickness are all wakefulness for the sick. It is an announcement for the sick that they have a sickness. He then says, So know this principle, O principle seeker. Whoever is in pain has a smell of him. Those who are in pain have a smell of the truth. Whoever does not feel pain is a lax and senseless inanimate object. He continues, Whoever is more awake feels more pain. 
whoever is more aware is more pale-faced. Just take a look at the social problems of man. There is an indifferent person who only minds his own business. He does not mind whatever happens around him. He only wants his donkey to cross the bridge. In the words of Jalal al-Ahmad, after his donkey crosses it, he does not care whether the bridge is destroyed. But on the other hand, consider a concerned person. That which he is not mindful of is his own donkey. In this regard, the commander of the faithful, Imam Ali, peace be with him, made mention of the same pain. In the letter addressed to Uthman ibn Hunayf, the Imam said, Shall I lie with a satiated belly, while around me there may be hungry bellies and thirsty livers? Or shall I be, as the poet has said, It is enough for you to have a disease that you lie with your belly full, while around you people may be badly yearning for dried leather. Another person is such that if his stomach is full while other people are hungry, he feels pain. And in the words of the Imam, peace be with him, in the Hijaz or the Yamama, there may be people who have no hope of getting bread. Is affliction laudable or displeasing? Now, let me ask you, is it better to have this pain or not to have it, such that one is not touched by whatever happens to his neighbor and even if his neighbor is to be beheaded, he would not moan? We recognize the former, not the latter, as perfect man, because to feel pain is sensitivity, it is not a sickness. It is not a defect either, but rather it is perfection. That is, it is a sign of his solidarity with other human beings. It shows that he really considers himself like a part of a single body in relation to other human beings. And because of an ailment or wound in another part, he is not at ease. The noble messenger of God, peace be with him, and his progeny has a saying in this regard which Sa'adi has expressed in poetry. That is to say that the faithful are like parts of a single body. If one part experiences pain, other parts experience the same. For example, if a tooth is aching, other parts of the body will not say, it is good for the tooth, may experience more pain. The hand will not say, why should I deprive myself of comfort? The eye will not say, why should I rob myself of ease? So too with other members of the body. As a bodily member experiences pain, other limbs sympathize with it. How do they express their sympathy? It is by feeling the pain and being awake. Whenever there is pain, all parts of the body feel the same and are conscious and wakeful. It is said that the faithful are like that. Sympathy is sensitivity, and thus it is not a defect. In fact, it is perfection. Therefore, if a person really and seriously advocates laxity and indifference and strongly condemns the intellect or intelligence on the ground that it bestows feeling to man and feeling is the source of inconvenience and pain, this logic is unsound. It is against humanity. And Islam condemns it. To have such a pain has been praised by Islam. But if it is not taken seriously and a person wants to deal with the subject metaphorically, and he actually wants to say through such an expression that such and such exists in the outside, then there is no problem. For instance, we say, how I wish I were blind and not be able to witness such and such. Now, if something bad happened while I was blind and not able to witness it, in reality nothing would have been changed, and that is different from going blind afterwards. The point is that the event was so heart-trending that I wish I were blind and not able to witness it. By saying so, I actually want to express the evil of that event. This is form of expression in our poetry and other literary works as I have explained. The disparagement of the intellect and knowledge and the question of livelihood. We have another logic which, if we take seriously, is far more unsound, and that is, some people treat knowledge, the intellect, and everything as tools to acquire material comforts in life. When a person who thinks that he is more intelligent and learned than others sees that many illiterate and uneducated people are richer than him, he begins to curse the intellect and knowledge thus, and says, what is the use of all this knowledge such that if a person brings a copy of the Qur'an in front of a grocery shop, no one would give him any vegetables? We have many people who are like such. Obeid Zakani has a famous poem in this regard, 
and he was also like that in practice. He says, O Khawaja, do not pursue knowledge. Be satisfied with looking for daily bread. Take buffoonery as your profession and be a student of hired musician so that you could receive remittance from the younger and the elder. It is a criticism of his time, saying, During my time, knowledge is of no value and the status of a hired musician is ten times that of a learned man. The value of an hour of work of the musician is equal to a month's work of the learned man. In practice, Zakani also became like that. That is, later on he really pursued buffoonery in spite of his being a learned man. Of course, this way of thinking is also not right. It means that one must not assess knowledge or intelligence through the barometer of money and wealth by saying that it is good if it can produce money and wealth, and if not, then it is devoid of any value. There is a poem in Arabic, apparently it is by Abu al-A'la Ma'arri or Ibn al-Rawandi. Both of them are known in Islamic history as atheists. He says, So many intelligent people consider an intelligent fellow as a person who comes to a standstill in life. He does not know which direction to go, he is miserable. So many ignorant people consider an ignorant person as someone has plenty of income. And this is something that turns a highly learned man away from religion and makes him an atheist. This is why he must have the opposite conclusion in this regard by saying, since sustenance does not depend on this cleverness, then I must understand that the management of sustenance is in the hand of another being. We are much acquainted with this way of thinking, and it is clear that it is wrong. One must not assess knowledge or intellect by such criteria. For the meantime, we shall set aside this subject. Intellection according to the Mu'tazilites and Ash'arites. Let us proceed to the tendencies that turned into schools of thought. Among of them is the Ash'arite school, which has actually rendered the heaviest blow to Muslim intellection throughout Muslim history. Since the middle of the second century after Hijra, there have been two tendencies regarding the principles of Islamic beliefs in the Muslim world. One group held that the intellect in itself can be the criterion for understanding the principles of Islamic belief, and first and foremost, we must assess by our intellect all issues. Issues concerning God, resurrection, angels, prophethood, laws, and others. The intellect is an absolutely decisive criterion for man. For a certain reason, with historical roots, this group was later on called the Mu'tazilites. On the opposite end were people who, due to a certain historical reason, have been called the Ash'arites, who advocated blind obedience and submission, saying that the intellect has no right to interfere in religious issues of Islam. Rational goodness and wickedness. The main subject begins with the popular question on rational goodness and wickedness. The Mu'tazilites believe that actions are either intrinsically good or intrinsically bad, and the human intellect can discern this goodness or wickedness. From this, Islamic law can be inferred because it cannot be separated from the intellect. Their primary example is the question of justice and injustice. They said that the intellect can discern justice and the goodness of justice is intrinsic and not contractual. Nobody has promulgated justice to be good, just as nobody has promulgated number four to be an even number. It is not that a certain number four could be an even number or an odd number, and then later on it was agreed upon that it is indeed an even number. Instead, number four is intrinsically and essentially an even number. Either number four does not exist, or it exists as an even number. They argued that the case of the goodness of justice and the wickedness of injustice is the same. Now, let us talk about actions. This action is just, thus it is good. Thus, Islamic law definitely confirms it. That action is unjust, and since it is unjust, definitely it is evil, and since God does not allow wickedness, it is naturally prohibited. 
The Ash'arites said that things do not have intrinsic goodness or wickedness at all, and the intellect also cannot discern such issues. Goodness or wickedness is legislative, shari'i in nature. Whatever God commands is good because he commands so, and he does not command so because it is good. Whatever God prohibits is evil because he prohibits it, and he does not prohibit it because it is evil. On the contrary, the Mu'tazilites said that God commands whatever he commands because it is good. Thus, its goodness precedes the command of God, and its goodness is the reason behind God's enjoining it. The Ash'arites said, no, it is not so. Whatever God commands is good, since he commands it, and his command is the reason behind it being good. When we say that an action is good, it is good because God commands it. The same is true with his prohibition. The debate over intellection, ta'aqqul, versus obedience, ta'abbud. It was here that intellection was situated on one side and blind obedience on the other side of the spectrum. This state of affairs truly reached its height in the Muslim world. It started on the early Umayyad rule and reached its peak at the middle of the Abbasid rule when there was more freedom of mind and there were so-called enlightened caliphs like Harun and Ma'mun who hosted debates and discussions. In particular, Ma'mun and thereafter his brother Mu'tasim, who himself was a learned man and a patron of logic and philosophy, supported the Mu'tazilites and suppressed the Ash'arites. Among the traditionists, or Muhaddithin, Ahmad ibn Hanbal was bitterly persecuted for his support for literalism. It was at this time when the so-called advocates of intellection won, and overwhelmingly won as such, over the so-called advocates of blind obedience. Incidentally, there were no intransigent traditionists and jurists at that time. The reign of the Abbasid Caliph Mutawakkil came. He was a very narrow-minded Caliph. In today's parlance, individuals who stick to the past are called traditionalists, or sunnati. The word sunni, which means sunnati, refers to the one who follows the tradition, or sunna, and does not subscribe to thinking, fikr, and intellection, ta'aqqul. However, since the sunna was associated with the Prophet's sunna, the terms acquired a sense of sanctity. Mutawakkil became a traditionalist and he strongly opposed intellection and the Mu'tazilites. He ordered their persecution and they were bitterly persecuted. Ahmad ibn Hanbal, who was imprisoned and bitterly persecuted during his time, was granted a very high status. It is reported that 800,000 people escorted his funeral. The latter caliphs strictly followed Mutawakkil's modus operandi and Ma'mun's was condemned forever in the Muslim world. The word Sunni. The Sunnis, as they are called today, are not the opposite of the Shia. We think that the Sunni is he who believes in Abu Bakr as the Prophet's immediate successor and the Shia is he who does not believe in it. It is not so. In the beginning, the word Sunni was not in contradistinction to the Shia. It was rather in contradistinction to the Mu'tazila. When it is said he is a Sunni, it is meant that he was not a Mu'tazilite. But today we call both Mu'tazilites and Ash'arites Sunnis. At that time, which was the time of the Imams, the Shia were with the Mu'tazilites in this respect and not with the Ash'arites. The word Sunni was juxtaposed against Mu'tazila, but since Shia shared some things with the Mu'tazilites, word Shia was later juxtaposed against Sunni after the Mu'tazilites were persecuted and among the advocates of intellection, only the Shia remained. Thereafter, a way of thinking emerged which perhaps associated the word Sunni to the question of caliphate, although it has nothing to do with its root. Yet, the word gradually acquired this meaning. In the Millennium Congress on Sheikh al-Tusi, held in Mashhad, Agha Haj Mirza Khalil Kamarei made an interesting observation on the word Sunni, a good word applied by the Ahl Sunnah to themselves. He said, They defrauded us in the dark. They came and chose this beautiful name for themselves, saying, 
we are Sunnis, which means that we follow the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah and that others do not follow the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. This is while the contention is not about the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah in that one would say the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah is authoritative while the other would say that it is not authoritative. Even the Mu'tazilites would not say we do not accept the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. The contention is on the quality of inference and in treating the Qur'an, the Sunnah, and intellect. If we set aside the intellect, we cannot also understand the Qur'an and the Sunnah, and this argument is correct. The Rigidity of Ibn Taymiyyah and the Wahhabi Movement The most prominent scholars who are also against the intellect and intellection are the followers of Ahmad ibn Hanbal, the foremost of whom was Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah lived in Damascus in the 8th century after Hijrah. He was a diligent man and, in a sense, a genius. He was indeed a genius, but he had an extremely rigid and narrow mindset. Some are broad-minded but not profound thinkers. Ibn Taymiyyah was of this type. That is, when a person happens to see all his books, he will be amazed as to how could a single man study all those subjects, but he will find out that they are not profound. Ibn Taymiyyah was a reviver of this tradition of Ahmad ibn Hanbal. It means that of all the followers of Ahmad ibn Hanbal, none surpassed him in reviving the style of the master. He even wrote a book prohibiting logic, arguing that studying logic is basically unlawful, let alone studying philosophy. The Wahhabi movement which emerged a century and a half ago was inspired by Ibn Taymiyyah. The Wahhabis are votaries of Ibn Taymiyyah. The foundation of this movement is also an anti-reason movement. As such, they strongly oppose logic and philosophy and they are extremely Sunni in the sense of the word, meaning that they are literalist, exoteric, and rigid. During my first Hajj pilgrimage, I paid a visit to the Islamic University of Medina. I met a very smart Pakistani student named Hafiz Ihsan. After acquaintance, he learned that I am teaching logic and philosophy in Tehran. He was very elated, and he would always join our caravan and ask questions. I sensed that he was thirsty for knowledge. The reason for this, he explained, was that teaching logic was prohibited there, and this is a strict following of Ibn Taymiyyah's tradition. So, these tendencies started with the Ash'arites via v the Mu'tazilites, and reached their peak during the time of Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Both Mutawakkil, the political patron, and Ahmad ibn Hanbal, the religious patron, pushed literalism to its zenith. Later on, Ahmad ibn Hanbal gained followers, and the most dangerous of them was Ibn Taymiyyah. For some time, the Hanbali school, or madhab, had lost following in the domain of Islamic civilization except in West Africa. But after Ibn Taymiyyah, this school was revived twice, and once again the Wahhabis patronized it. All of them are anti-intellection tendencies in the Muslim world and are deplorable tendencies as such. The Akhbariya The Shia world was immune from this literalism and the reason for this, as I have explained, was that this movement emerged during the time of the Imams, peace be with them, who were very close to the Mu'tazilites in this respect such that in history the Shia and the Mu'tazilites are mentioned together and are called Adliya justice advocates. Many people even called the Shia Mu'tazilites and called the Mu'tazilites Shia. The literalist movement had found no way among the Shia until four centuries ago. About the same time as the initial period of the Safavid rule, there emerged a man named Mirza Muhammad Astar Abadi, who adopted the Ahl al-Hadith literalist style. And more influential than him was his student Mullah Amin Astar Abadi. It is interesting to note that those who initiate movements, including literalist movements, are geniuses. And if they were not so, they could not have founded movements. As a case in point, Ahmad ibn Hanbal was not an ordinary man either. Mullah Amin Astarabadi stayed in Mecca and Medina for many years. He wrote a book entitled Fuad al Madaniyya, in which he made a strange assault against the Shia ulama for being allegedly responsible for introducing intellection in Islam. For instance, he sternly rebuked Allah Mahalli. Mullah Amin 
advanced a notion saying that there are three reasons why the so-called four sources of law, that is, the Qur'an, Sunnah, consensus, and reason, are invalid sources in the sense that none of them is authoritative. The Qur'an is not a basis. Reason or aql is not a basis. Consensus or ijma is not a basis either. Regarding consensus, he said, consensus has no root at all and was adopted from the Ahl Sunnah. This very consensus has brought misery to Islam. Consensus is that which established the caliphate of Abu Bakr. The Sunnis came and made it a principle in order to establish the caliphate of Abu Bakr. They then introduced it in jurisprudence and the Shia also came and introduced the same in jurisprudence. Consensus is not ours, it belongs to the Sunnis. He kissed a copy of the Qur'an as gesture of respect and placed it on a shelf. He did not say, we do not accept the Qur'an. He said, we accept the Qur'an, it is the book of Allah, but it is not for us. It is for the Imams. It is only the Imams after the Prophet who can understand what the Qur'an states. We have no right to exercise intellection and reflection on the Qur'an. The Qur'an was essentially revealed to its immediate addressees. It is they who are familiar with the language of the Qur'an and understand its meaning. The Qur'an communicates through a special language and that language is only understandable to the Imams and no one else. He would kiss the Qur'an and put it on the shelf. Regarding reason, he would occasionally express an extremely enlightened and innovated inference. It was similar to the words of Descartes and others against philosophy. He made important statements against reason. He would discuss and criticize the words of philosophers, pointing out in which aspect or aspects they allegedly erred in their views. Then, as contemporary scholars also pointed out, he would address the question, what is the source of the mind's mistake? Is it in form or substance? He would then say that Aristotelian logic is a symbolic logic and the maximum it can do is to show the mistake of the mind in the mental order or the mistake in the order. It is like an architect who can only make a good design of a building, but it is beyond his work to determine the quality of construction materials such as bricks, cement, or steel. The Aristotelian logic can only correct the form of inference. Most of the human mistakes, however, are in the substance of thinking and not in its form. What shall we do with it? There is no option. Since there is no option, one must not rely on the intellect in religious matters. He also discarded reason, saying, what we have is only the hadith, what we have is only the sunnah, and he strongly condemned ijtihad as allegedly introduced in jurisprudence by Shia ulama, saying, ijtihad means intellection, and intellection is not permissible. Taqlid is also not permissible. We must be followers or muqallidin of the imams only. Writing a treatise on practical laws and exercising ijtihad are haram after haram or prohibited after prohibition. The words of this man were so fatal that he actually initiated in the Muslim world a serious movement called akhbarism or akhbariya, whose followers are also called akhbaris or akhbariyun. This movement shook the Shia for some time, and in some places, it even triggered wars and killings. Particularly in the sheikhdoms of the Persian Gulf, this logic impressively gained acceptance. During the initial years of the Safavid rule, Najaf and Karbala were cradles of akhbarism in which no one could dare to talk about exegesis of the Qur'an, reason, inference, or consensus. They would say, what we have is only the sunnah. What we have is only the hadith. They would assault those who would say, hadith may be authentic, sahih, weak, da'if, reliable, muwattaq, or acceptable, hasan. Allama Hilli and others classified the traditions. Some traditions are authentic. Some are reliable. Still others are weak, yet others are acceptable. The sahih or authentic traditions must be treated in this way, the reliable or muwathaq tradition in that way, the da'if or weak tradition is not credible. Mullah Amin replied to this and said, what is this nonsense? Hadith are da'if or non-da'if? Every hadith is credible. 
What Mullah Amin Astarabadi did among us was exactly like the movement of Ahmad ibn Hanbal and ibn Taymiyyah among the Ahl Sunnah. The victory of Ijtihad over the Akhbariya. Of course, this movement was later on crushed by great ulama or scholars, like the late Wahid Bihbahani. Wahid Bihbahani, who lived during the Safavid rule, was the teacher of Bahr al Ulum. This man was among those who spearheaded the movement of intellection and ijtihad against the Akhbaris and revitalized ijtihad via v this rigidity and literalism. After him, the late Sheikh Al Ansari, who was also called the master of the late comers, rendered the last blow to Akhbarism in favor of ijtihad in that the Akhbaris were marginalized afterward. But Akhbari thinking is not totally eradicated. Remnants of such thinking exist even among many mujtahideen. This was a brief account which shows that although Islam has given such value to reason, as indicated even in hadith, social currents sometimes have gone contrary to it. These currents emerged in the Muslim world, including both the Sunni and the Shia world. In this context, we do not want to prolong the discussion because fortunately, we have to say that within us Shia today, the advocacy for justice has won over Ash'arism, at least logically. You can notice this point whenever you read any book which is taught in the Islamic seminary or Hawza Ilmiya. If you ask any seminarian, are we Shia justice advocates or Adliya or not? He will reply that we are justice advocates and that we are Adliya. Or if you ask, do we acknowledge rational goodness and wickedness or not? He will say that we do acknowledge rational goodness and wickedness. The reason behind is that the likes of Shaykh Al Ansari have totally strengthened the foundation of this concept, and the notion of Mullah Amin Astarabadi emerged along the way. The root of Akhbarism according to Ayatollah Burujardi. Although I do not know his reference, the late Ayatollah Burujardi said something very interesting. In the summer of 1322 or 1943, when he had not yet moved to Qom, we went to Burujard. I heard it there and not heard it again in Qom, and I forgot to ask him about his reference. There was a time when he mentioned Mullah Amin Astar Abadi and his arguments against reason, saying that this movement, which was similar to the movement against reason and philosophy in Europe, was based upon sensory perception and empiricism that was originated by Descartes, Bacon, and others. They opposed logic and intellection in a different form but based upon the credibility of sensory perception. Ayatollah Burujirdi claimed that Mullah Amin was influenced by the ideas then prevalent in Europe. What has remained unknown to me is that at the time, those ideas had not yet been introduced in Iran. So, how was Mullah Amin influenced by them? Perhaps, since he was most of the time not in Iran and traveling, especially in Mecca and Medina, on those travels he might have met someone who introduced those ideas. However, Ayatollah Burujirdi's criticism was that if the Europeans came forward and upheld the senses, denying reason as independent from the senses and saying that reason is credible so long as the tangible things are its domain and its function is only to abstract, generalize, analyze, and synthesize the tangibles and nothing else, it was because they pursued the natural sciences and had no need for the intelligible or ma'qul things. You want to discuss religion. The primary issue in religion is God, and God is the most intelligible in the world. How can you afford to introduce the denial of reason in religion? The Europeans base their denial of independent reason on the primacy of the senses. For this reason, there is no objection to them. In your case, however, you want to deny reason on the basis of the primacy of hadith. Do you conceive God and his absolute unity وحدانيه, through the hadith? If you are asked, does God exist or not, what will you say? Definitely you will say God exists. If you are asked again, on what basis do you say so? Will you say, as I study Wasail al-Shia, I read therein that Imam Jafar al-Sadiq said that God exists? 
Denial of an independent reason on the basis of the primacy of the sensory perception is one way, but denial of the primacy of reason on the basis of the primacy of hadith cannot be accepted at all because our most fundamental Islamic issue is the most invisible of all. No less than the Quran uses the expression ghayb, unseen, in Surah 2 verses 2 to 5. الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ Who believe in the unseen. How can you prove and infer the unseen by using the hadith? We believe in Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, peace be with him, because we assert that he is an imam. Why is he an imam? We say that it is because he is the successor of the Prophet, and the Prophet designated the imams. What is your basis in believing in the Prophet? We say that God sent him, we must prove this for ourselves, even explain the Prophet himself, by applying reason. God must be proved by applying reason. First of all, the existence of God must be proved. The Prophet's apostleship must be proved. Then the imamate, or leadership, of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq must be proved. Only then could we accept a hadith reported from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, peace be with him, with the assumption that it is authentic. But if, at the very outset, we want to begin with the hadith, we will reach nowhere. The Mu'tazilites' Extreme Reaction I have to point out that extremism and excess are always the cause of destruction. The Mu'tazilites, who upheld reason, also went to extremes a bit in actions. They came and rejected at face value a thing which cannot be perceived by the intellect. That is, it neither negates or proves it. In other words, that which the intellect cannot understand. This was a sort of nourishment for the Ash'arite school. That is, people who were drawn toward Ash'arism because they saw that the Mu'tazilites denied many things. For example, some Mu'tazilites denied the existence of jinn on the ground that the jinn cannot be proved by rational proof. But the intellect cannot claim that an invisible creature called jinn definitely exists. The intellect cannot understand this subject. What do we know, by the way? Perhaps apart from the jinn, there are millions of other invisible creatures in the world which are yet to be discovered by mankind today. Denial of such issues, such as that of the jinn, led some people to be pessimistic of reason, saying, The blind devotees, muta'abbidun, are good. If we want to preserve our religion, we must follow their way. If we want this intellectualism, then we must lose many things. Today, they, the Mu'tazilites, denied the jinn. Tomorrow, they will deny the angels. The day after tomorrow, they will also deny God exactly like the extremism of so-called intellectuals in our time. Intellectualism in itself is very good, but if it goes extreme ways, it will carry the seed of its own destruction. Intellect according to the jurisprudence, fuqaha. This issue was related to theology. Exactly the same thing happened in jurisprudence among the Ahl Sunnah. Some became advocates of blind obedience in juristic issues. For example, Malik ibn Anas, who was very prominent during his time and was a contemporary and student of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, as well as others, upheld analogy or Qiyas. Abu Hanifa became an advocate of Qiyas. He was also a contemporary of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, peace be with him, and became a student of the Imam, as he was reported to have said, had it not been for the two years of studying with Imam Sadiq, Nu'man, or Abu Hanifa, would have been wretched. Abu Hanifa was of Persian origin and lived in Kufa. He paid less attention to hadith, not in the sense that he paid attention to the sayings of the Prophet. Rather, he regarded most of the reported traditions as inauthentic, believing that they were invented. He said, of all the traditions reported from the Prophet, I believe in only a few, approximately 20 traditions, as having been said by the Prophet. I do not believe in the rest as having said by the Prophet. Of course, it seems that he had some poor information in this regard. In juristic questions, if what are available to us are the Qur'an and 20 traditions of the Prophet, 
it is obvious that we will have a deficiency in inference. That is, if we want to understand the laws through the outward aspects of the Qur'an and 20 traditions of the Prophet, Islamic jurisprudence with such vastness cannot be inferred. As a result, Abu Hanifa resorted to Qiyas. Qiyas means analogy or comparison. He would say on such and such subject, the Prophet said such and such. This subject has similarity to such and such subject. So, I can apply the ruling for the former to the latter. This is exactly the thing prohibited in the Qur'an. This is not obedience to reason, it is obedience to one's conjecture and surmise. The issue of imagination and conjecture is different from that of reason in that reason precisely finds out a ruling. It was here that the issue of conjecture, surmise, and analogy found its way into jurisprudence, and a machine for analogy and deduction of rulings based on imagination came into being. And the same was described as the use of reason. If reason is supposed to interfere in issues, this will be the outcome. Anyhow, Abu Hanifa found the school of analogy, but even the other Sunni Imams did not submit to it. Throughout his life, Malik ibn Anas used analogy in only two issues, and on his deathbed he expressed regret for using analogy in those issues. Ahmad ibn Hanbal vehemently opposed analogy. Shafi'i held a moderate view. He applied analogy but not as extreme as Abu Hanifa, and he was not like Malik ibn Anas for being so-called hadith-centered. No doubt, Abu Hanifa held an extreme view. The Ahl Sunnah themselves have reported that he was so accustomed to analogy that sometimes he would adopt analogy not only on religious issues but also on natural matters, thereby producing ridiculous accounts. It was reported that one day Abu Hanifa went to a barber for hairdressing while there was some white hairs in his beard. He said to the barber, pull out the white hairs so they will not grow back and only black hair will remain. The barber told him, it is actually the opposite. If I pull out the white hairs, they will grow more. He said, so pull out the black ones. He immediately made an analogy. Thus, if white hair is to be pulled out, it will grow more. So the black hair must be pulled out. In other words, on the assumption that with respect to white hair, it is true that if it is pulled out, it will grow more. Definitely, it is also true regarding black hair that if it is pulled out, it will grow more. Such analogies were also made about religious issues. Because the school of the Imams or Ahlul Bayt, peace be with them, is a proponent of justice and intellection, it did not uphold analogy because analogy is in reality not intellection. It is submission to one's conjecture, surmise, and imagination. The Imams strongly rejected analogy, saying, Indeed, if the Sunnah is to be subject to analogy, it will be extinguished. Yet the Imams, peace be with them, did not reject reason. And here, you can observe that there is a difference between the Shia and the Sunnis. The Sunnis say that there are four sources in jurisprudence, the Qur'an, the Sunnah, Ijma or consensus, and Qiyas, or analogy. The Shia ulama or scholars, however, claim that these sources are the Qur'an, the Sunnah, Ijma, consensus, and Aql, or intellect. The Imams, peace be with them, affirmed Aql, but not Qiyas. This shows that the method of the Imams, peace be with them, as well as that of the ulama, was not against reason, but against analogy and that analogy is not a correct, rational instrument. Of course, some jurists have expressed an extreme form of refraining from analogy, and this is in itself a kind of sickness. When something is said, they would immediately say, oh, this is analogy, although in reality it is not analogy. They refrain from saying it, saying, sir, this is analogy, and the first one to make an analogy was Iblis, or Satan, and similar arguments. This is another tendency in this regard in the Muslim world. 
we have another tendency on the question of reason and irrational religious edicts, and that is mysticism, or irfan. Mysticism is also, in a sense, opposed to reason. The rationalists and philosophers' reliance on reason thus goes, the leg of the syllogizers is of wood. A wooden leg is very infirm. I shall discuss it with you next meeting, God willing. End of chapter 15